Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Southwest Center for Human Relations Studies at the University of Oklahoma for the first installment in the student track of our monthly webinar series. I'm Asia Mukes, Communications and Project Manager, and we are excited about the 2019-2020 season of our monthly webinar series. Our hope is that we continue the conference's tradition of working to improve racial and ethnic relations on college campuses by providing virtual learning opportunities. This season is sure to be amazing. We have a lineup of scholars who will cover a wide range of issues, including immigration and DACA, institutional reform and planning, and critical pedagogy. This season, we've introduced a new student track that focuses on ideas that speak directly to the experiences of students and is either facilitated by or co-facilitated by a student. They are intended to identify emerging scholars and connect students in the in-core community to each other. Our student track webinars are always available at no cost. Make sure you're live posting. We want to know what you're watching. So tweet, Instagram, and Facebook pictures from your office with the hashtag Encore and hashtag start the conversation online. You may end up in a very special Encore video. Today, in the first session of our student track webinar, we have Crystal Cruz. Crystal is completing her final year of doctoral studies in health education at Columbia University's Graduate School of Education, Health and Psychology, Teachers College at Columbia University. Crystal is a Bill and Melinda Gates Millennium Scholar, a committee member of Columbia University's Office of University Life, Race, Ethnicity, and Inclusion Task Force, Campus Conversations Working Group, and she contributes as a mentor at the Roger Laheka Double Discovery Center at Columbia College, which seeks to enhance higher education opportunities for low income and first generation college bound Manhattan area youth to ensure high school graduation, college enrollment and completion. Today, Krista will be discussing the Thrive Guide, a guide for helping students of color navigate higher education. The center is grateful for Crystal's expertise. So I'm gonna turn it over to Crystal now. Hi everybody. I appreciate everybody taking the time to join me for this webinar. It's very exciting to have you all here so that we can collectively problem solve and have ways to cultivate enabling academic environments for students of intersectional identities. And so with that being said, let's begin the presentation. So I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. It is customary at NCOR during the sessions that we acknowledge the land. And so I would like to take the time to do so right now on which I, the presenter, sits and occupies as the traditional and ancestral home of the Lenape people. Without them, we would not have access to this webinar gathering and to this dialogue. So I would like to take the opportunity to thank and honor the original caretakers of this land. So a little bit about me is that I first attended the 26th Encore in NOLA in 2013 as a Bill and Melinda Gates Scholar. Every year they bring Gates Scholars to Encore and that was how I had my first exposure to this um, uplifting and transformational space. I've also spent time working with students from high school to um, doctoral programs with mentorship and helping navigate the structures for them to see their academic degrees through to completion. Um, specifically, Upward Bound was very pivotal for me at the University of South Carolina because I was teaching students in a facility that had provided the first ever academic credentials to African Americans in the whole state. And I truly felt that it was very influential to have that opportunity on such hallowed ground. I've also worked as a Gates Scholar Ambassador and as y'all heard, a Double Discovery Center um, mentor as well. So I'm actually not, um, it's a little bit of an untraditional background, I would say, because I'm public health. My specialization is infant and maternal health, specifically health doulas can help women at, with at-risk pregnancies to have healthier pregnancy outcomes. Um, so this 
NCORE was just a very enriching outlet for me to look forward to that I could sometimes bring in my public health uh, lens to the realm of higher education. So I would like to just first really emphasize the two most influential professors for me being able to create the Thrive Guide in addition to my own lived experiences. The first is Professor Fully Love. Dr. Fully Love um, is on my dissertation committee and he is the one that helped me understand that I didn't have to reinvent the wheel and that I could actually stand on the shoulders of giants and further contribute to the literature and accomplishments of amazing scholars that came before. So thanks to Dr. Bob, um, I was able to um, push back some of the initial inertia to create this Thrive Guide through thanks to his influence in telling me I didn't have to reinvent the whole wheel. And then my doctoral advisor, Professor Barbara Wallace, she is the first ever African-American woman to move through the ranks and become a tenured professor in the history of the institution. And she has graduated well over 100 um, doctoral students of color. And it's through her influence that I have just flourished and thrived at um, the institution. So I just wanted to really acknowledge them before proceeding. Okay. I would like you all to know that there's a secret private Facebook Thrive Guide at Encore Group. If you would like, you don't have to take too many notes. You've all been sent a copy of the Thrive Guide and this PowerPoint presentation will be uploaded to that Facebook group. If you would like to be added, please email me. And if you don't have Facebook, still email me and I can send you the slide so that you can spend time just um, absorbing and not uh, taking too many notes and being as interactive as possible. So why create a Thrive Guide? So I developed it specifically for Encore. It's never seen any audience other than those who are already um, showing a willingness to receive this kind of knowledge. Uh, and so I developed it in 2015. And the first presentation of Thrive Guide was in 2016. And in 1988, the Southwest Center for Human Relations Studies launched Encore to address the resurgence of racist incidents in higher education. That's from the Encore website. So I used that the origin story of Encore to inform why I should provide this Thrive Guide to students of color and also first generation students and also students who may be white students that are neurodiverse or other intersectional identities that have hidden and invisible disabilities or working class backgrounds. So this, there's a lot of applicability, not only for students of color, but it was primarily designed in mind for them. Okay, also, a justification for making the Thrive Guide was to provide and impart navigational capital that I accumulated as I was, as I navigated as a um, first generation student at the doctoral level. Um, and my uncle did get his MBA at um, UPenn, but uh, my mother's a kindergarten teacher. So there was nobody else that I could really turn to other than the Gates Foundation. And we had academic empowerment managers, but not every student of color has, or every first generation student has an academic empowerment manager that can help them have retention within the institution. So I developed this guide with them in mind because I really wish that I could have had this guide when I had first stepped foot in my undergrad. <laughs> Um, and then also another justification for this Thrive Guide is to allow practical insight. And I do have to thank Asia here at um, Encore because thanks to her constructive criticism and feedback, this presentation is far less theoretical than it was going to be and much more practical. So um, thank you for that. And so it's important that administrators and higher ed personnel understand the lived experiences of students of color or working class students or first generation students. They can be either or, or maybe all of them. But what we're trying to do is not exploit their personal narratives. And that's why this Thrive Guide is so important to provide insight into their lived experiences with able to cultivate multicultural sensitivity and competence in order to implement practical um, enhancements within a institutional environment. And the reason this is important is because it will enhance retention, enhance students' quality of life as they go through their programs, and also, most importantly, cultivate a socially just institutional climate. And that can also help with minimizing any violations with the Department of Education Office for Civil Rights. And I know every accredited institution that is a recipient of federal funds wants to maintain compliance with the 
Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights. So this Thrive Guide is really helpful in that regard as well. So there are currently three Thrive Guides, but because of time constraints today, we will we'll only look at part one. And um, part one deals with self-efficacy and self-determination, overcoming imposter syndrome. So Thrive Guide navigational capital is what we're talking about um, in this webinar. So the conceptual framework, there are these concepts that are driving and underlying in this Thrive Guide. Now, if there are any additional questions about how these are operationalized, please save them to the question and answer. And I have extra slides that I can send you that further elaborate and explore all of these different concepts. But I'll just highlight them right now quickly before we get into the actual Thrive Guide. Um, structural violence, institutionalized violence and oppression, dismantling institutional racism, implicit bias, really important, microaggressions in institutional climates, as well as thriving functioning. So that, those are what is underlying pretty much the entire guide. So the navigational capital that I mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot of scholarship that has provided evidence-based information that there's effectiveness in employing these strategies. So I will start to highlight slide by slide each of these points in this webinar. First, self-efficacy. So the reason I really like self-efficacy as a strategy for enhancing the student's ability to successfully see their degree through to completion, despite um, experiencing any challenges while they're navigating higher education, is because I really like how self-efficacy builds upon itself. So for example, I underline self-assurance that serves them well in mastering subsequent challenges. So once a student has in a model, for example, in my doctoral program, we have a collaborate, collaborative model where we all sit together in a seminar and, we, in, and we're staggered in terms of where we are towards graduation and seeing others performing successfully that are like you, that are maybe first gen or students of color, it definitely does raise efficacy expectations. So later on in the Thrive Guide, you're going to see there is a phenomenal professor at Brown University who has a first generation seminar, a class that all freshmen take. And I would say that that is one of the most effective ways to early on plant seeds of those self-efficacy expectation potentials to raise. And once the student can feel a self-mastery over certain academic achievements, they can just keep building on it to master subsequent ones. So that's something really important about self-efficacy. Okay, so in the Thrive Guide, you will see plausible academic environment examples that I provide for students to see how different sources of self-efficacy can be translated into a real world example. The transferable skills or having a model. So obviously I'm not gonna read all the details because of time constraints, but I do want to explain when you get into the Thrive Guide and you see these tables, what, what they're about. Um, so I will give you a small example here where um, inactive mastery experience, for example. A professor tries to tell the student, okay, great essay, but we would like to see you cite it in a different citation format. But so the student needs to somehow not freak out and understand they mastered APA, they can master another type of citation. Or for example, vicarious experience source of self-efficacy. Me personally, I remember I was so shy to see a model from like a student that might've been a, like a year or two ahead of me, even though that's what I needed the most. And later on when I finally developed enough uh, self-efficacy that I could master asking my colleague to show me how they did it so that I could replicate their approach. We're not talking about plagiarism here, okay? So, I'm talking about sharing the, the, the formula of how to have a model to see how it's done. Um, I have basically allowed so many models and I've only been plagiarized in my whole academic trajectory twice. So 89 to 90% of the time it works to have a model from a colleague. Um, okay, the next concept is self-determination. Self-determination is about intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic motivation. What is 
propelling the student to want to actualize an academic achievement. So it's about autonomy. It's about having the capacity to choose and not feel that something is compelling them in a coercive manner. So in order to get students that maybe are shy or hesitant about approaching something that might seem daunting at first glance because it's totally new, the important thing is to try to internalize and integrate those extrinsically motivated behaviors and the connection to how to, to achieve that integration. So there's self-determination achieved and there's less cognitive dissonance about wanting to do an assignment that is required that might seem challenging. Is to, I found the trick is to encourage students to see what's, what their values are that are driving why doing something with extra, extrinsic motivation is still necessary and worthwhile. So when you get into the Thrive Guide, you'll see many more examples of the motivational types of values that help drive self-determination. So the students will become more autonomous and understand the connection of why they value what they're doing, even if it's a required for a course assignment that they maybe feel overwhelmed to initially approach. So the final slide about self-determination, I really want to highlight th these three components that you see on the right-hand side of the screen. Competence, which is where the imposter syndrome comes in, which we will get to in the next slide. Autonomy, which is the self-determination that we just described. And relatedness. This relatedness is so important because it talks about feelings of connection and feeling cared for within a socially supported, mentally health protective space in their campus community. And this is so, so key if there's anything that could propel thriving functioning within an academic environment, it would be having that socially supportive, safe, safe and brave space that's cultivated. And the way we can safeguard these three things, which are fundamental needs, um, and that is why I say in enabling academic environment, it's because we can diversify our student um, in the campus, but that doesn't mean it's enabling. So here's how we can have practical strategies. Like I mentioned, Gregory Elliott at Brown, he has um, a first generation college students course and he, his course has been um, talked about in the New York Times and on the Brown website. So I encourage everyone to see what Professor Elliott's doing at Brown. As well as um, establishing a first generation graduation ceremony, we have that. We also have a Students of Color Alliance that does a Students of Color graduation ceremony. Um, you can also organize the Scholars of Color writing workshop series. That also helps with the self-efficacy and raising um, subsequent self-mastery potentials. And also creating a flip. First, uh, First generation low income partnership. At NCOR, I have so many um, administrators that come to our sessions that are curious to know how did they start their own first generation low income partnership. And I would strongly encourage you to look at Thrive Guide part two, um, which will give you step-by-step -step instructions and examples of how to start your own first generation low income partnership at your campus. So this imposter syndrome, is something that really touches my heart every year, year after year after year in our sessions at NCOR. This is the one the students hone in on and wanting to conquer, overcome, and address. And so basically it's all about academic self-concept, perceptions of their self-efficacy. This, this sense that, okay, there's no, there's no evidence that shows a student that has imposter syndrome definitely has low self-esteem. It's, it's, they can have adequate self-esteem and nonetheless still experience imposter syndrome. So I think it's important as students to know it's not, there's no shame in um, your self-esteem being low because you feel like that's where the silence comes in. And a lot of students are not apt to speak about it unless the, the environment allows for that. And it's very hard for students to admit to experiencing imposter syndrome. So in order to help them move along and to push past any shame or internalized uh, oppression regarding experiencing imposter syndrome, I provide them a practical checklist. A checklist. So I let them see the symptom checklist 
And um, I asked them, how many of these do you experience? And so we can determine in a kind of objective way that takes, takes it away from feeling completely personalized to something a little bit more, I guess, intellectual. And I always um, notice the discounting of recognition from others. So that really concerns me as somebody who mentors students because it shows that there's something that we really need to, as people who want to see students of color and first generation students and working class students succeed in higher education, we really have to figure out a way not just to give them an accolade to say, okay, there, you should have your, um, you, you shouldn't feel like an imposter anymore. So there, it's not about just giving them a, a, a medal or a trophy, okay? So this is something that we have to really work at in from a bi-directional influence within the students themselves, as well as within the institution to help the students help themselves flourish and overcome these internalized feelings of imposter syndrome. I really like what Columbia does. We have um, in our counseling and clinical counseling psychological service center, an entire imposter syndrome um, student support group, I believe it is. And it's something like that where you, 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 you make it institutionalized within the academic environment where it's something that students can go in a safe space and talk about. And if that means making an entire new support group in your counseling and psychological services to address that, then that would be a really great thing to do. So the students though, I advise them to use cognitive restructuring and provide them with um, how to change their imposter related thinking patterns. And I do want to also show how intelligence viewed as a fixed entity versus having um, a continuum by, so there has to be a gray area. I believe getting some flexible thinking is something that can really help with overcoming the imposter syndrome. And then um, I also want to talk about this concept of burnout. Sometimes when students are not able to readily overcome imposter syndrome, they can perform something called high effort coping. And I was really thinking about the Gate Scholars in mind when I created this section of the Thrive Guide because a lot of us have very unrelenting high standards to the point where we could burn ourselves out sometimes and have to take even a deferment um, to, to, to regroup. So I want um, people watching to, to try to avert the likelihood or decrease the propensity of this um, high effort coping and burnout by not addressing the imposter syndrome, if that is what they're experiencing based on the checklist. Okay, cultural wealth and transferable skills. I really love this section about the Thrive Guide because it shows that communities of color have their own um, capital to draw on and transfer into an academic environment that is empowering and validating. And also they can translate their own uh, cultural capital into the classroom. So I would like to show you all how that looks like. Okay, so navigational capital clearly is my favorite um, because it allows for social competencies to allow students to survive, recover, and thrive even after stressful events. And when I say stressful I events, I mean like experiencing a microaggression or experiencing um, maybe a grade that wasn't ideal. And so the reason I feel that navigational capital is so relevant for an academic environment is because you can still sustain high levels of achievement, which is what we all want in order to see our academic degrees through to completion. So that is why I really hope the students will hone in and I highlighted navigational capital for examples. And on the far right side of this um, table, for all the forms, there are seven forms of capital that I've indicated here, there are transferability to academic environments. And what we do in this session is we go through as peer educators and we co collectively brainstorm about how this um, capital can transfer into an academic environment within the students. So maybe um, if there are administrators or other residence advisors or anyone watching, they can 
replicate that same dynamic with the students that they're working with to help them not just give them the answers for how their own because we are experts in our own lives so they themselves are the ones that will know how it can transfer and so um i want to also highlight some real life examples of capital that we are all engaging in right now um transformative resistance capital it's number seven transformative resistant capital when we go to Encore, this allows for us to have the motivation to transform any kind of oppressive structure. Now, it is not an institution is oppressive or it's not oppressive. It has social structural violence or socially violent communication or it doesn't. It's a continuum. So there are pockets and oasis of um, professors that students can go to professors of color but the truth is that can also provide burnout for students to go to um, race concordant professors all the time to try to in to process some of the invalidations they might be experiencing in their campus so that is why it is so important which thrive by part four is going to talk about white allyship as well to have all faculty and administration and students as allies to create and cultivate an enabling academic environment. And then resistant capital. This capital, if you guys and gals just go to the demands.org, you will see it in real action, <laughs> resistant capital happening. Anyone can just go and Google the demands.org and you're gonna see an, an amazing example of that. And then social capital, um, lifting as we climb paying it forward to whom much is given much is expected and this is really important in transferring to academic environments because the students will have many more life chances to succeed in their academic programs when they are um, lifting as we climb to towards graduation okay so professor williams um at harvard he is amazing when it talk when it comes to talking about institutional racism and dismantling it and implicit bias and, and normalizing it without stigma so when he talks about undoing institutional racism again i reiterate it's not about diversifying the student body it's about making it an enabling academic institution so we need to ensure that they're not just admitted but that they are retained with the least amount of trauma possible as they obtain their academic credential so um we open the doors and we allow them to walk through them but we also want them to thrive and not just survive all right so professor wallace um talks about institutional violence and oppression and so we want to see what happens when this because this is this is when students of color or first generation students or working class students are made to feel unwelcome, unaccepted or disrespected within the institution or even students who are not of color, but they have invisibility or disregard in case they have hidden or visible disabilities and they may experience mar being marginalized as well. So the reason this is important is because it can increase your stress hormones. If the norepinephrine, the cortisol, all of that is running high, they're problem solving and they're processing to absorb their, their, their schoolwork is going to be compromised. And that will just compound and run the risk of the retention issue as well as of student quality of life issue and mental health issue. So it's really important to address any institutionalized violence and oppression because of the stress reactions and also because of the social justice issues so um to talk about the stages of change for practical scope coping skills this is a simple model where a student can think about how they want to view themselves as a first generation student or not so um i just want to stress that in the thrive guide it's not just about the student the first generation student of color um, navigating their identity development. I provided examples of um, institutions also have, it's a bi-directional thing. So the institution or the organization will also be potentially having to use practical coping skills as they shift their 
physical, social built environment to accommodate um, students with these intersectional identities in order to make them enabling for them. So although the example I'm giving in the next slide, um, or the slide after this, sorry, is about the students' identity development, I also don't want y'all to be like, okay, what is all this other stuff and not understand like why I put that there. So to stress, it's, it's, it's ecological. It's not just one, one, yeah, okay, so y'all get it. Okay, so I really, if anybody is new, probably not because y'all are all in higher education, but I am a big proponent of anti-oppressive education and critical pedagogy. So I just wanted to give y'all a screenshot here. This is not in the Thrive Guide, but again, you can join the Facebook group and I will have the slides. Um, but I really like this because it talks about the contradictory nature of education where it can oppress and marginalize. However, they maintain the potential to emancipate and empower. So I just really want to encourage everybody here to know that yes, sometimes these are difficult dialogues to have and issues to contend with, but nonetheless, we're 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 let we're in the best position to leverage that potential and actualize that potential to emancipate ourselves and others and empower to reach our goals. So microaggressions. Um, this goes back to in, in institutional violence and oppression. So the godfather, you could say, of microaggression was. Um, Professor Pierce, and he was a psychiatrist, and he talks about it's not just like one micro experience, it's the fact that it's chronic, it's a cumulative effect, it's ongoing, and it causes even like mental and public health disease. And so we should recognize what are microaggressions and address them in an appropriate manner. So I just really wanted to explain where the concept came from, and um, now I will go to the next slide to show how we can enact his advice to take appropriate action. In addition to um, making a bias incident reporting system, it's also important to see that microaggressions are at so many levels. Um, and there's different types. So I did want to expose the audience to the work of Professor Daryl Wing Su. He's so beloved at our institution in the Department of Counseling and Clinical Psychology. And he talks about the damaging impact of microaggressions. And the most important thing I like about Dr. Sue and uh, Dr. Williams that I, ex I explained how he said that we need to make sure that it's not just, oh, sorry, let me just focus on Dr. Sue, um, is that he, both of these professors show that people are well-intentioned and they're well-meaning. Nobody goes out usually in a higher educational environment wanting to harm each other or to have socially violent communication or nonverbal communication. But even though they, that's not their intention, sometimes it can happen. Um, well-intentioned, well-meaning people who are unaware. But that's why it's so wonderful to have spaces like Encore so that we can allow ourselves to become aware and therefore trans, like, transcend beyond um, oppressive institutional environments. So I just really want you to know about Professor Sue and um, it's in the Thrive Guide information more about microaggressions and please do look up his work or his videos and yeah, so. Okay, so peer education. <laughs> in our sessions at Encore, we talk about that identity development for the first generation students of color. And so at the pre-contemplation phase, this is why um, there may be some shame regarding first generation or having a working class background. And that is why I really like the model that's happening at Brown because freshman year, first semester, they're in this seminar. They're in this proper core required course, not core required course, but it's a seminar that students can elect to have for credit. And so, that's where you can nip the imposter syndrome in the bud, you could say. And so as the student goes across this continuum, they can start to contemplate maybe acknowledging their first gen, that they may be different than the majority of their student body, or they might be at a predominantly white academic institution and feel, okay, there's just um, 
a small amount of students that maybe look like them or even professors. So this is where there might be some cognitive dissonance and while they're preparing to acknowledge their first generation status or whatnot. And there may be behaviors that manifest, um, but nonetheless, they're contemplating and preparing. And all of this maybe isn't, this is subconscious potentially, but um, decisions made to explore that status, joining groups that are providing them with some validation or mentally health protective spaces of um, social support. Then there's the action stage um, here. They start to finally accept, okay, this is my institution too. And I have a first generation low income partnership um, organization I can join thanks to my school enabling this environment for me to do so. Or they can begin to feel they have that cultural wealth and those cultural, that cultural capital that has transferability into their academic environment, things like that. So you can go and look at table nine in Thrive Guide part one to get a much more in-depth um, stages of change for them navigating their status as these students within the campus. Okay, I want it to, provide you with my colleague's Facebook group. This is for students. It's called the Critical Scholars Club. He is named Johnny Yaj. He's also a Gates Scholar and he presents with me at Encore. What I do every year is bring like four or five students from my school and we go together to uh, co-facilitate a seminar or a session at Encore. And he has a great Facebook group for students and it's closed but it's not private. The first uh, Facebook page I showed y'all was private, so I will add you if you email me. But his is, you can find it if you want to screenshot or just Google Critical Scholars Club. And I think students will find it extraordinarily enriching and supportive to brainstorm ideas, how to get diversity coalitions up and running in their school. And so, yes, I did want to show um, information about this Facebook group. And then I wanted to talk about the Thrive Guide part two, um, the contingencies. So emotional regulation uh, will be talked about in Thrive Guide part two. Um, more information, like I mentioned earlier about the first generation low income partnership, how students can learn, know that the Office of Student Accommodation Services even exists and how to actually navigate those structures to enroll as well as how a first generation student could resolve a grievance and book recommendations. And then Thrive Guide part three is about activist scholars of color, how they can identify mentors, how they can uh, decrease stigma about mental health seeking behavior, how they can uh, create as well as have work in tandem with their administration and higher ed personnel to create identity-based student group campus spaces and additional online resources. And then Thrive Guide part four is going to be all about white allyship. And this is completely streamlined and rooted in Encore because they are the ones that allow for a racial, um, whites partnering to dismantle racism uh, identity group caucus at Encore. And there's also an annual white privilege conference. And I will talk about my colleague. Um, he is the dean at UC Santa Cruz and he taught a, and teaches a whiteness power and privilege course. It's phenomenal. And of course, Tim Wise, he's a keynote, I believe it was last year at Encore. So Thrive Guide Part 4 will talk about all about white allyship. And um, I wanted to open it to question and answers. Um, I also want you all to know that um, if there are no question and answers, I maybe will go further into the theoretical constructs that are informing the Thrive Guide in that case, but I still want it to open it up for Q and A's to see um, before I go further into that. Okay. Thank you, Crystal. 
Um, are there any questions? If there are any questions, I'm going to encourage you to use the Q&A box. It's a, a better way for us to be able to keep track so we don't lose it in the chat box. No questions? If not, I can totally keep going. Okay, we have one question okay, so far. Sure. So Sean said, you may have mentioned it, but how do we get access to the Thrive Guide? So actually, I'll answer that question because in the email that was sent out with your registration information, the Thrive Guide was attached. And also on um, the Facebook group that I created, you can email me. I sent the um, slide up here with my email address. And um, if you just email me, I'll add you to this private Facebook group if you can't find it. Um, and the slides and the Thrive Guides, all of them will be uploaded in the Facebook page. And are there any other questions? So Laura says, I'm wondering if there are specific recommendations you would make to supporting students who have reported incidents of uh, discrimination on campus aside from the investigation piece? Yes. Um, it's Thrive Guide Part Two that I create. I provide all of those recommendations. It's on page ten of Thrive Guide Part Two, and it talks about informal mediation. It talks about um, even private higher education consulting private higher education specialized pro bono lawyers to get uh, further insight and guidance. So. Could you please ask the question once more just so that I can um, make sure I'm answering it thoroughly? Sure. Are there any specific recommendations you would make to supporting students who have reported incidents of discrimination on campus aside from the investigation piece? Well, so what I did was I, cre I helped create a diversity and community affairs committee within the student senate. And I was uh, one of the co-founders that also created the uh, mission statement um, about civility and diversity and inclusion. And um, that for me was very uh, uplifting and it made me feel that even if I, I was I was vicariously experiencing somebody else because because I was the university senator, so I was hearing about thir certain things um, that students felt upset about potentially. So I tried my own way to feel that I was making a contribution to enhancing the environment. Um, so it doesn't mean that you have to go full on investigation mode. That you can enhance and subtle ways and plant seeds that will flourish even after you graduate because you help lay the scaffolding for structures that will enable a more socially ju just campus climate. And also you can um, ask a, probably you would want a tenured professor to hold maybe a town hall meeting to discuss um, difficult dialogues or civility issues, or maybe make a seminar about microaggressions and in institutional climates or um, something like that, where nobody is being accused, but it's still maybe going to allow for more people to get exposure to an insight into others' lived experiences who they may not necessarily default relate to. So that's how I might be, maybe would have addressed it if I didn't want to go full on investigation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have uh, two more questions. It says, as a professional counselor, how can I create programming and spaces to support first-generation students of color? So like I mentioned earlier, um, as a professional counselor, that's so wonderful because you can provide them with confidential, um, trans confidential, safe, inclusive, brave spaces where they can uh, be have less stigma, but the issue is getting them into mental health seeking behavior. So that has to become addressed and normalized. And the way you do that is by maybe making social media um, posts or some sort of uh, Twitter campaign or there ha or get collaborations with the student groups or somehow it has to come from the students themselves that mental health 
is a normal thing that we can talk about, that we can address, and that we can um, per, we can make sure that it's protected. And that's just like what we believe as an institution. It has to become so normalized in the dialogue on campus. And I know that that takes a long time sometimes to establish that new culture, but um, we, there's the Jed Foundation. There's so many uh, foundations that can help with students on campus so that they will have uh, less stigma to um, seek these kind of supports. And that's what Thrive Guide 3 addresses. And so please email me and I'll give you that section. I'm so grateful for all these questions. Uh, so it says, what are some recovery steps for students who have already gone through the burnout phase? Okay, so I can speak from, so a lot of the, I wish all of my other colleagues are here in, a real, in, in, in the real life session in Encore because we all have our own way of addressing it. So for example, when I was um, 19, my father had passed away and I actually did try to go in a few weeks later after summer vacation straight away into the fall semester. And that's that, that's, that's that higher for coping that we sometimes do. And then I had to actually um, take a semester off in order to just like grieve. And so um, every student's going to figure out their own way. But what would be helpful is that there is an, an enabling academic environment that allows students the knowledge and the skills sets to navigate structures that minimize any stigma to to receive those help, those that that help. For example, um, I didn't know that the Office of Student Accommodations existed. If I knew that they existed, I could have enrolled in that and and not felt bad about having to ask my professor for an extension after my father had passed away. Right. So if students know early on that they, that this exists, and if they're first gen and they didn't have a disability or hidden or visible disability in high school or before, they wouldn't even know that that structure exists. So then if they have some um, life upheaval, then how would they know to utilize it? And even if they do know how to utilize it as a first gen, they might feel that they feel shy to access it or stigma. To so there has to be this normalization of the institutional structures that are just like first day, the students have full knowledge and reiterate to the students that these structures exist with step-by-step -step instructions on how to access them and what is available to them. I think there's just so much um, stigma and shame that I just keep saying those words because I feel like until the first generation student has already reached the, the maintenance phase in their navigating their identity development, there's a lot that can happen that would affect the retention, their quality of life, and or strongly pave the way for burnout um, due to the high effort coping. So I hope that answered some of your questions. Yeah, that's a, that was a great response. Um, so Christy asks, if you could sit in on a department chair meeting or all faculty meeting, what's the one piece of advice you would want them to know? Great oh my gosh, I love this question. I lived this question. The first thing I want them to know is that white students matter too. And just because we're trying to hone in right now on students of color or um, other students with intersectional identities, it doesn't mean that we have to say that to the detriment of white students. On the contrary, we can say if you are able to accommodate students of color. They, students of color are not a monolith and neither are white students. White students need the structures as well. There's interest convergence here. White students, they have neurodiversity. They have hidden and visible disabilities. They have working class status. They have first generation status. So it's like, that's the kind of conversation that I think needs to happen straight up front and the second thing is to say implicit bias is real. There's evidence-based research confirming it for coming out of Harvard. That's where like the epicenter is regarding um, in, implicit bias. There's no shame because we're socialized in society to have implicit bias, but let's talk about it. And nobody is blaming anyone to be racist because we want to address it. So those are the kind of things that I would like to say because sometimes um, people shut down 
immediately when they think that they're being mm, perceived as a person who isn't as well intended. When Professor Sue's research co clearly confirms they're well intended, but they just need to know that sometimes um, oversights can happen. And so that's the kind of conversation I would want to have straight going into as a overview before even beginning to start to unpack and address the other issues. That's really what I would do so that people's um, stress hormones aren't activated and then it's hard to process and, and absorb the information and strategize, frankly. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. So uh, our last question, unless others have more, please use the Q&A box. Uh, it says, thank you for this presentation. I haven't had the chance to read the Thrive Guide, but I feel like much of it is transferable to high school students. If we work with high school students, is there a particular place you recommend counselors to start? Yes, um, there are, there's, I think, a book that's on Amazon and it's through the TRIOS program. And I forget what school it's about, but it's, it's a recent book and it's about the experiences of first generation students. And I think exposing the students to their narratives before they even hit the ground running in their first day on campus would be a great place to just start to help normalize again what the experience might be like and see, let them see the successful models to have that self-efficacy and self-mastery scaffolding already in place before they matriculate. So yes, look up um, the narratives of first generation students by the TRIOS program, a publication. Excellent. We are still getting questions in. So okay. Ohio State asks, so you mentioned most people are well-intentioned and well-meaning. Where is our current climate Whereas our current climate has individuals being harmful and hurtful with intention, simply serving the role as a recovery from the act of words. How do you address this piece when intention is trying to take the place of an apology and education? Um, it's a little bit difficult for me to um, conceptualize that question. So what I'm going to do is um, after the webinar, I'm going to take it from Asia and then contemplate it and then I can respond back either to you through email or to Asia and she can send it to you my written response because it seems like it's going to take a lot more contemplation and introspection to answer it in a way that does justice to that question there's a lot of different elements to it yeah I think that's a fair unless you want to restate it um, or you can restate it yeah yeah if you want to restate the question um, it's not a bad question. It's, it's, it shows that she's really, or he, I'm not sure, <laughs> is really interested in grappling with the social climate of the time. And that's, that's what I am doing too, because this is the 400 years of inequality um, year. There's a lot going on in society and there's never been a more important time to have these kind of dialogues and have a guide like this in our society so yes thank you for that question if you want to restate it great if not i can respond by a um, written response to you um so why don't we move to the theoretical framework okay um which great. will help kind of frame oh wait ohio okay so So that is not my attention, that is not my intention has replaced, I apologize or I'm sorry. How do we continue to address this? Okay, so I uh, would say the color of fear. It's a amazing um, book, it's a workbook, and it has real life examples of these dialogues. And so I would point you to the color of fear. I think even there was, a session at Encore a few years back on it. So do explore that. I think you will find it very enriching. And um, do you have anything to, to, to add sort of directly to that point? So like how that was not my intention has replaced, I am sorry. Um, and how do we, do you understand that point? I think so, that 
it's coming from your idea that most people are well-intentioned and well-meaning. Yes. That's so what we Professor allow people. Us. Do we excuse people away? Um, do we allow, I'm sorry, that's not my intention to replace, I'm sorry. Well, I've, I'm all about formal apologies. I love formal written apologies whenever possible. So no, in, in my opinion, we should still have formal apologies. And that's why having environment, institutional environments where the climate is such that we can have these dialogues and it's not something that raises eyebrows. It's just like, it's embedded in the institution where there's this culture of civility. And of course, everybody's gonna make mistakes and sometimes people will infringe on the, on the code, but we have to, I guess there are some quotes in the Thrive Guide that I, that from the Wounded Healer that I would really encourage you to read. And I feel like it would definitely um, speak to this question. If I can for just a second. Um, so the, the goal I keep hearing, you know, to have a dialogue, to increase dialogue across campuses. And I, I feel like when that's not my intention is used as a way to avoid responsibility, then that's where the dialogue then becomes important because that is asking the question, well, what was the intention, right? So what, what and, and how do you come to some kind of mutuality around, um, you know, reception and intention? Yes, because saying it wasn't my intention doesn't absolve someone of culpability if there was like a harm that was incurred by their microaggression against someone. And this can be a teaching moment. And the important thing is, is you acknowledge that maybe it was an oversight. They maybe were well-intentioned or maybe they had no intention. It was just an oversight. And if that's the case, okay, why, rather than shut that person down from even being in the position to be receptive to um, behavior change that would be more inclusive, um, allow them to maybe initially not feel the pressure to be overly formal and apologetic and instead just let them be on their own stages of change for navigating their identity development as a more liberated, conscious person who doesn't want to cause microaggressions. It's got to come innate. We can't like compel people. We can just lead by example of being humane and having forbearance and trying to be as civil as possible to each other. Um, and so, uh, someone mentioned, asked if you could uh, mention the books that you said again. So there's the one done by the TRIO program. Yes, and um, there was The Color of Fear. There was another book that I wanted to mention called um, Nonviolent Communication. There were books by Professor Sue um, that I also highlighted under the various types of microaggressions that can occur in an institutional climate. It's called Microaggressions in Everyday Life and Race Talk and the Conspiracy of Silence. That's why facilita facilitating difficult dialogues on race is so important because silence can be inadvertently seen as compliance to whatever happens. So if we witness the microaggression, mm, th this is our collective institutional climate. So we are all a part of this ecosystem. And so that's why Thrive by Four is going to focus on white allyship. Um, because I attended the, not the White Privilege Conference, but the um, caucus uh, for white dismantling racism. And there were such amazing resources for anti-oppressive education and critical pedagogy and all these concepts about power and privilege. It just was so eye-opening. And so, um, yes, the dialogues are super important for um, definitely t turning down the volume of being initially triggered and feeling that the person is being on blast when they're just simply um, navigating their own white racial identity development and how to become an ally. Um, so do you want to move to the theory? Yeah, I do. Okay, so if, if, just in case there are any more questions, are we good? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I want to I want to talk about an article as well called Cultural Capital and First Generation College Success. This um, scholar is at a school here in CUNY, and um, she's pretty much um, the most prominent scholar on uh, first generation college students as it relates to cultural capital. And um, in case anybody was more interested in diving deeper into some of the um, cultural capital and institutional capital and navigational capital concepts, I underlined two um, articles as well. And so there's that. And now we're going to talk about some of the um, some of the conceptual concepts that are underlying the Thrive Guide. So before I do this, I just want to go and grab the slides for everybody to be reminded about the concepts. Okay, so we're talking about structural violence. We talked about institutional violence and oppression earlier on. Dismantling institutional racism, implicit bias, we've kind of reached uh, talked about and in microaggressions, we talked about it in thriving functioning. So pretty much structural violence and dismantling institutional racism are the ones that I'm going to highlight now to y'all. For y'all, sorry. Okay, so structural violence, if you look at the third paragraph, please, it talks about the arrangements, the social arrangements. They are structural because they're embedded within the society and they are violent because they cause injury. And when I say injury, I mean like real um, psycho, psychological and physical harm because elevated stress hormones can actually weather the body. There's something called the weathering hypothesis. And it's actually been proven that when you have elevated stress har hormones and it, it, they take longer than normal to return to baseline, you can actually, even if you're, you can actually be physically, um, more weathered than you would have been had your emotion, had your stress hormones been able to be more regulated. So um, the structural violence term, it is, talks about social inequalities as well as offenses against human dignity. And the most important thing I want to highlight about structural violence, in addition to how it actually like is harming people physically, is that it constrains agency and that is against one of the core things to self-determination that we talked about, which was um, competence and feeling uh, autonomy. So that's something I think is important to talk about when you hear the word violence. I, yes, it sounds scary, but it's social interactions that can be violent um, for the person who is chronically exposed to them and or even those who are vicariously witness witnessing them okay so professor uh williams talks about racism as a system and he really highlights using the ecological framework that yes we're, there's individual races okay but that's not what is doing the most damage those are like isolated instances but we're talking about racist institutions, socialization in the society that are having people operating with bias that they're unaware that they are operating with. And so that's what perpetuates, sustains, reproduces socially violent social institutions. And so think about it in terms of wanting to dismantle institutional racism in order to promote this a, a way that society is structured such that people aren't differentially allocated opportunities, life chances, and different forms of capital and resources um, just because of um, unconscious bias that isn't addressed and how social institutions are either enabling or not uh, students of color to achieve their their institutional capital in the form of a credential which can then be translated into their ability to have upward social mobility through their income after graduation um, he talks about implicit bias and that's where dismantling it is so important um, professor Williams said that without your conscious awareness. So that is why he says people are just petrified. It's at the bottom of this uh, 
of this life. People are just petrified of being labeled racist and they would feel that even acknowledging hidden or un unbeknownst to them implicit bias would be acknowledging a profound level of racism that is a character assassination in some way. And he's saying, no, they're normal because even beyond race, ethnicity, even people who are being um, explored and researched by their professions have negative implicit biases. And so again, if you want more information about this, please just go to um, Harvard's website because they have like years and years and years of research about this. And so he's saying that they are natural as a result of our socialization. And so when we discuss the evidence-based research about it, that it's true, we're not just like saying something that hasn't any valid, that hasn't been validated, then we can start collaborating and working together to hold the difficult dialogues without putting people on the defense. And so that is kind of um, an important thing because in this Thrive Guide, uh, maybe some institutions might be at a different stage of change where they are navigating their own and contending with their own um, historical, uh, potential historical roots of oppression within the institution, which is why I wanted to show you all the work that's being done by mentors. Um, for example, AERA has a Revolutionary Mentor Award and there are mentors that never turn away students and they gave her an award saying that she is radical in her inclusivity and thoughtfulness. So some institutions may not like the word radical, but sometimes it is a radical thing to, to take down the stigma and to talk about difficult dialogues in a, and cultivate these safe, brave, inclusive as possible spaces. This is sometimes radical because every institution, just like every student of color, is all navigating on different stage of awareness of how they want to evolve or develop. And it's, it's not a straight path. Sometimes it takes steps back. Sometimes it can go into the action stage. Sometimes it's maintenance. Sometimes we're back to pre-contemplation. So it's, it's, it's constant ebb and flow of social evolution within an academic environment. And very many moving parts, many actors, many bi-directional influences between the people, the personnel, the students, and the physical built environment, social environment. So it gets, it can be a little overwhelming. So that's why it's important to have spaces like Encore so that we can talk about these seemingly at first glance ambiguous, subtle, things, but we can actually name them, identify them, and then address them. And so um, this same uh, Revolutionary Mentor Award recipient, her name is Professor Yolanda Seely Ruiz, she actually had spoken, she talked at the investiture of the president of my, of my school of education, and she said something so beautiful that I wanted to share with the, um, with the webinar community. She said about the academic institution, she said, you, the institution, invite us to envision a you yet to be, bridging the gaps and making space for all to thrive, to overcome and to flourish. She said, a place where barriers are struck down and promises are built up. We are the builders. We construct bright futures and turn from practices that break spirits. A beacon, a foundation for civic, social, and economic flourishing for all. The reason I want to highlight this is because no academic institution is expected to be perfect. It's what we can envision collaboratively, collectively, yet to be. And so that's really important. And so I want to tell you there's a great success we recently had this summer. Professor Edmund Gordon, he founded the Institute for Urban and Minority Education at Columbia School of Education. And he was given a permanent affirmation that the beliefs, ideas, methods, and accomplishments of Professor Gordon are fundamental to the highest ideals of what it aspires to be. So we have our first person of color in, in a permanent plaque. It's so big, it's so beautiful, so that other students can see 
professors and faculty that look like them on the walls of their institution. So this is like one way to make a institutional environment validating and enabling and it's such a glorious moment because many students um, revere Professor Edmund Gordon. And then, um, let me see. Oh, so I wanted to share in case all of you are interested in coming to Encore next year. Um, it's going to be in New York City, so you're more than welcomed. I would love to be your tour guide. Uh, honestly, just message me and I can um, give you all the pointers. And so we have community guidelines and since there's some extra time, I wanted to share them. So every time we begin a session and you can use these community guidelines in your institution as well. So every time we start a session at NCOR, my colleagues and I try to cultivate a safe, brave, enabling space where there is no fear to speak up and nobody feeling that they're being spoken over. So first and foremost, gender pronouns are a must. So I'm she, her, hers. And then we encourage students, if you take space and you make a comment, please make space because some students may be um, less apt to speak up. But if you have already taken space, give them time because every student needs maybe their own amount of time before they want to contribute. Or maybe they don't want to contribute at all. So that should always be an option so nobody feels that they're being put on the spot. And then obviously using I statements. That's why when I answered a lot of the questions, the question answering, I tried to say I and my own lived experience because I believe we're all experts on our own lives. So I really hope that when I answer the questions, I was um, practicing my I statements. And then no jabs, I love this. No judging, accusing, blaming, or shaming. Even, no, even non-verbally, no raising eyebrows, no, things that can inadvertently invalidate or microaggress somebody who is trying to um, explain their what they want to contribute in the dialogue. That's important to also cultivating a brave space and a safe space. And then saying, I got your back and finger snapping, my colleague, um, the one who I explained to y'all had the Facebook, the Critical Scholars Network Facebook page, Johnny Yaj, he, we say, I got your back. And if somebody is sharing a story amongst their community that they, they're getting activated or it might be a little bit traumatic to, so while we can validate them while they're sharing, and even though it's a challenge, we just say, I got your back. And it gives them the encouragement they need to know that they can still speak their truth and be heard and be witnessed in their lived experience in case they need to process something that might have happened within the institution. And then finger snapping, instead of having to like clap really loudly or something, we can just finger snap. And then we tell everybody what's learned here leaves here and what's said here stays here so that there isn't a resistance to trying to really have full disclosure um, without any fear of some sort of aftermath for sharing and divulging um, sensitive, difficult things in a group environment. And then always allowing the suggestions from the participants that they themselves may need, and it changes from room to room, session to session, end core year to end core year, um, in order that they can allow for contributing what they need in order to have a good, difficult dialogue um, and feel safe and included. And then um, we have stations, end core sessions, so we rot rotate so the students change like I'm constantly there at every session but my colleagues they come or some different colleague comes every year I bring like I said four or five um, and so we just have stations where all the students can rotate so I'm explaining this to you all because you can replicate this in your own institution because it doesn't just have to happen once at Encore every year it can happen every single day at every school all over the whole world or especially in the US um, these stations where students can speak to a peer mentor, a peer educator, or like different um, administrators or advisors or counselors that are there to allow students to get exposure to them, know that their, their office exists, things to, again, normalize and, and, and decrease any stigma to interact with and, and interface with these different structures within the institution. And then I did want to highlight the Times issued a 100-page edition on its Sunday magazine about this being the 400th anniversary. Um, and so this is a very pivotal year uh, regarding, as, as a society, bearing in mind uh, slavery 
um, in the society, as well as how the institutions have a potential connection to slavery. And so given that, I just wanted to ensure that the recipient, I mean, that the audience knows about Ebony and Ivy. And so um, there is a lot of research exploring institutional ties and there are things being done to accommodate the physical built infrastructure within institutions to make it a more in enabling and less invalidating um, space for students of color, specifically African-American students. And so um, at NCOR, the, it seems that the epicenter of this research is coming out of the University of Virginia. So I did wanna highlight um, this uh, professor so that you can potentially uh, catch his session most likely next year where he's going to have a lot more uh, publications to talk about. And so he talked about how a university's history of slavery plays a role in the black student experiences. And this is a pilot study, but he's still collecting more data. So next year, look forward to um, experiencing more information about this. And then finally, um, we have a website at my school that talks about um, Colombian slavery. And it is actually the person who wrote Ebony and Ivy um, graduated from Columbia as well. So other universities, we're not alone, uh, Duke, Princeton, Georgetown, all of them have acknowledged their own institutional histories as it reveals to white supremacy and slavery. Yale, um, they changed the residential college name. Harvard also dealt with the coat of arms. So it's like, it's happening. It, obviously acknowledging and addressing institutional structures, it's going to happen for some institutions at a slower pace than others, but it's happening and it's becoming okay to talk about and to explore and to address. And so that all links up to the concepts that underlie the Thrive Guide, the institutional oppression and so the structural violence, all of that that translates into how do the students ex get exposed to microaggressions or not? How do they contend with them effectively or not? Do they have higher foot coping or how can we ensure that they're not higher foot coping and burning out? So all of this all ties in to enhancing and cultivating a socially just institutional environment while ensuring retention, ensuring compliance with the um, Department of Education Office for Civil Rights and ensuring a good quality of life for the students of various intersectional identities. And then um, I do wanna talk about locus of control, not now, but in the next, um, but in the next webinar for other Thrive Guides, I do feel that this is important. So I just want to put it in the audience's mind to know about the concept of internal versus external locus of control to be continued. So yeah, that's my presentation. Um, thank you so much for giving me your time and attention. And um, please know I'm highly accessible. You can um, email me and I will be more than happy to answer any of your questions in depth that aren't covered during this particular webinar and provide you with any other resources or recommendations, books, online, anything you would like um, at any time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Crystal. Thank you. We have 10 minutes. Are there any other questions? Did any other questions arise um, from when we had our first question break? Any questions? I see people are slowly logging off. Oh, we have one question. Um, is this, could you please repeat the name of the Facebook group for first-gen students? For first-gen students, yes. So it's called the Critical Scholars Club. It's facebook.com slash groups slash critical scholars club. And if you can't find it, just email me and I can manually add you um, if you would like. But so yeah, there's the, and it has a lot of resources for students too. Okay. Any other questions? We're so glad that the majority of folks stayed on the webinar <laughs> for the whole time. <laughs> That's always exciting. Um, Crystal, when are you due to graduate? Um, next May. I will have my oral defense in April, and then I will be at NCOR next May. And I won't be a student anymore at the NCOR, so that will be interesting. But I'm so grateful that my colleagues will keep going every year um, 
to keep the Thrive Guide session going. And of course, I'll be there even though I'll be a, a freshly minted doctor and no longer a student. But I hope that the students and the administration and the higher ed personnel will also join another session that we are going to make just for them as well. So we'll have two, one for students and one for the um, administration and higher ed personnel. Excellent. Um, so Eastern Mennonite University asks, uh, we watch this webinar as a group. Is it okay to share the Thrive Guide with everyone? Um, yes, please. I would strongly encourage you to share it with any student that you think, or even an, an, uh, a faculty mentor, anyone, residence advisor that you feel would benefit from having exposure to this kind, these kind of, um, not this, just this kind of knowledge. So definitely, please, by all means, share. Excellent. Any other questions? Uh, Crystal, can you put your email address up again? Yes. So um, it's here. KMC2247 at Columbia.edu. Or you could just say my first name, Crystal.Cruz at Columbia.edu. Both words. So tomorrow you all will be receiving a survey uh, for the webinar. We send out surveys after every webinar. I'm going to encourage everybody please to fill them out. Um, and the second is um, we hope to see you for our September student webinar. Um, our September uh, regular webinar is sold out. However, there will likely be slots available. And if there are, we will be posting them on Facebook when we go live, we'll be posting the link. Uh, so pay, pay attention to social media, follow Encore on um, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so that you can get updates um, on if there become slots available for webinars that are filled up. Uh, so someone asks, you mentioned the JED Foundation. Have you looked at the equity and mental health framework? Any thoughts as to how the Thrive Guide connects to the framework? Wow, that's such a good question. Actually, I haven't, and I'm so grateful for you like pointing out the connections for me, so I should go and further explore it, honestly, um, because in the past few years, the JED Foundation has become very um, influential as a driver of um, protecting the mental health of students on my, my own campus here. So thinking about connecting it with the Thrive Guide would be something really, really cool to do and to, to show um, the student body, not just here, but at NCOR next year as well. So thank you so much for giving me a heads up about it. We have seven minutes left. Um, Oh, so the follow-up was, uh, the framework is so good, would definitely recommend. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, we will. So we will not be sending out the recorded version of the webinar. It will be uploaded to our YouTube page and to our website. So we just encourage you to keep looking. And once, that, once it is uh, uploaded to the YouTube page, it'll likely go out on our social media. So um, we just don't. We don't have the, um, the bandwidth to send all of the unpaid webinars out. And I could also upload it on the Facebook group. Oh, great. And share it to the Facebook group. Our YouTube page is just Encore. You can type it into the search bar and it'll come up. All of our um, unpaid webinars are there. And also, if you go to our website, www.encore.ou.edu, um, our webinar series, um, the registration links are there, but the webinars that are unpaid and available to just watch are there as well. So, um, Crystal, thank you so much for your expertise this afternoon. You all have her email address. So if you want to email her, connect with her outside of this space, or plan to connect with her in New York uh, during Encore 2020, you are more than welcome. She has invited you. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, thank you for coming and thank you, Crystal.
thank you all as well. And thank you for allowing me to show the Scholar of Color Thrive Guide in this new format on webinar after so many years in person at the conference each year. So thank you for helping it evolve. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.